Coming up on Tech News Weekly, Snopes managing editor Brooke Binkowski tells us how Facebook is doing uh, at clamping down on fake news. CNET's Shara Tipkin has thoughts on Apple's upcoming release of the HomePod. Ars Technica's Sam Moscovich shopped at Amazon Go and lives to tell the tale. And Megan and I share our thoughts on the Twit Switch 2018. All that more coming up next on Tech News Weekly. Netcasts you love from people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Tech News Weekly, episode 16, recorded Thursday, January 25th, 2018. This episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Grammarly. Download Grammarly, the intelligent writing app, for free by visiting getgrammarly.com slash wit. And by Grasshopper. Stay connected and run your business from your mobile phone with Grasshopper. To save $50 on your order, visit trygrasshopper.com slash wit. Welcome to the show that we like to call Tech News Weekly. We love to call it that because that's its name. <laughs> true. It's true. We talk about the news. We talk to people making the news, breaking the news. I'm Megan Maroney. I'm Jason Howell. Sometimes we talk about breaking phones. There's yes. something I need to tell you, Megan. What? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, it's time to check in on this person, Jason Howell, and this other person, <laughs> Megan Maroney, to see how the grand twit switch of 2018 is going. We thought we'd start the show with this. If you don't recall, two weeks ago, uh, I gave Megan my Pixel 2 XL. Megan gave me the iPhone 10. It's been laughter and hijinks ever <laughs> since. So... What do you think two weeks in? Uh, I really like it yeah. a lot. I am pleasantly surprised. I think that the newest uh, Android operating system, which I believe, judging from the amount of Oreo cookies on your desk, is actually <laughs> called Oreo. <laughs> yes. I Don't I eat like, the cookies, though. <laughs> I think it's much improved over what I was trying last year, which, which was Nougat. I never called it Nougat, and I never will. Okay. Um, I like Understood. everything about it. The settings seem to be exactly where I want them to be, whereas... Oh. Apple, I think, you know, I do a lot of digging around. Like, I always feel like Apple thinks it knows where I want a setting, but it never really is where I want it. There's just some, like, I mean, the simplest things, like yeah. turning on and off the Bluetooth, like getting, you know, it's just one tap, there it is. Um, and I really, I just like everything. I like every single thing about this phone. I like the fingerprint reader better wow. than the face ID. I think it's prettier. I love the camera. The two things I hate, one is Apple's fault, and that's messaging because Apple has iMessage, which they just call messages now, but it's really iMessage. It's a walled garden. You can't get in or out. And the mes the messaging, not only am I no longer part of all of my groups, mm -hmm. um, which to be honest, they were all segregated groups anyway of just iPhone people. So who needs people like that? I, I want more welcoming groups. Um, I'm Anyone who is just in an iMessage group, I'm out of there. Um, and also sometimes the messages just come in wrong. Like the sentences are all broken up. I've noticed that. I've absolutely noticed that. And that's that's confusing and frustrating when that happens. It's almost like a puzzle that you have to put back together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're like, which order does it go in? <laughs> so it's know. fun. Yeah, so, it's like a game that's like, like it's a that puzzle. you hate. They do. Yeah. They, it's like a game <laughs> that you hate. Um, so the other thing I love, and you say you don't even use this, it's the squeeze to assistant. So all no. you have to do is squeeze mm -hmm. your phone and there's your Google Assistant, and you can ask whatever you want, and it, it knows you and answers questions much better. Um, just, you just squeeze it. I just never use it. The only time that ever fires off for me is inadvertently. It's like oh, really? I, I grab my phone, and I, apparently I grab it at the wrong place, and it fires off. I'm like, no, go away, Assistant. I didn't actually summon you. So, just, but you like that. I do. D now, did you download the Google Assistant app on the iPhone or no? No, but that's a good point that you can. You like, can, yeah. <laughs> but you can't. But you can't squeeze. You can squeeze that phone as much as you want, and right. the assistant is never going to come. No, I mean, I you know, I I kind of buy into the at least at least for the most part into the idea that when we're doing the Twit Switch, I'm trying to use the stock apps, mm -hmm. but. It, it, but that's really hard for me because Google does make it so easy for you to bring in all their stuff onto the platform. So, of course, you know, I end up opting for inbox instead of the built-in email client mm -hmm. uh, on the on iOS. 
Um, but I, yeah, I guess that's one strength is that you could, if you wanted to, and you know, I've been using Siri and we're, we're going to record a piece a little bit later on today. I think you'll see it this weekend on the new screensavers where we're going to kind of, you know, pit the pros and cons of the assistant versus Siri based on our experience. But, uh, I, I get frustrated with Siri. Yeah. I think, I mean, it, we say we're going to pit them against each other, but I think we all know that Siri is not going to win this one. Well, but, Siri, but I, having said that, I will say that Siri has come a long way. Siri has improved. They off, it offers more contextual stuff in a visual sense than sometimes Google does. Sometimes you fire off an assistant query and you'll get a nice audible response, but it might just be like a, a dump from, from Wikipedia or whatever, whereas Siri will almost give you like a bunch of little pieces of information related to it. Or, or if you're doing a stock ticker search, it's not just the piece of information. It's here's everything you might want to know about that thing that you just searched and you get a more contextual kind of visual representation of your search. And hmm. I think that's pretty cool. That's strong on Siri. I don't actually believe in context, so okay. that doesn't help me. All right, well. <laughs> I, uh, uh, the thing that, the other thing I don't, don't like and uh, shall I say I hate is okay. Android Wear. Uh, um, yeah. I kept my Apple Watch for as long as I could and because you had these giant yeah. Android Wear watches. Um, and finally, Florence Ion, who hosts All About Android with you, she was like, I got you, Megan. Um, so here is the Michael Kors uh, Android watch. What is it called exactly? The uh, Michael Kors. Kors, Kors I can't um, remember. <laughs> Michael Kors Sophie smartwatch. It's got uh, something called Pave. Is that how you, it has an accent? I can only imagine that it's pronounced Pave. Okay. And that's either real or fake diamonds. I don't know. Pretty I think sure she said it was like $600. So I'm guessing that means fake. Yeah. I don't have a lot of experience Seems with diamonds. Seems like a lot of diamonds for $600. <laughs> um, but, but I mean, they're sparkly and that's what you want They're sparkly, for. but the um, power only lasted till two o'clock yesterday. Yeah, that's Which was good. a huge pain. I mean, that, the Apple Watch, which you're not wearing yet, because that was the other thing we figured out that uh, Flo just gave me these watches. They were logged into her account and all I had to do is reset them. Like they don't, they don't ask you for right. a password or anything. So if you stole someone's Android Wear watch, I guess the question is, is anyone stealing Android Wear watches? Apparently not. Uh, but if you stole one, all you would have to do is factory reset it and great, you can sell it or you can keep it or whatever. With your Apple watch, I tried to set it up after you had left. And even though you had reset it, in my login process, it was like, wait a minute, this is associated with someone else. So mm -hmm. find that person, have them enter their PIN, and then we'll give it to you. Yeah, and it's and still so probably, that's good protection. Yeah, it's probably still connected to find my iPhone. And, yeah. you know, because I think my first Apple Watch, Lisa had sold it back and it was still connected somehow. And they right. called and they had to, you know, say, well, um, you, know, you, you still uh, are attached to it. So right. apparently that's what we learned. People steal. Apple watches, but not they don't Android don't steal watches. Android Wear watches. Um, the other watch she gave me was the LG uh, Style, which is rose gold. And this is, a, I don't know if you can tell it, but this is a leather band, which you have to then take off if you're going to um, work out in it, which I don't, I don't recommend doing, if you're a big yoga person, mm -hmm. I do not recommend this because it sets just so your wrist always hits oh, this. And re, like I was yeah. doing yoga this morning and I reset like 10 times or it also summons Google Assistant. So, you know, you don't- No, see, really, that's helpful. You're like in the middle <laughs> of a yoga pose. You're um, like, yeah, I wanted to know yeah, that Yeah, what's downward dog? <laughs> no, um, but, uh, but the phone, I'm telling you, I really like it. Awesome. Right on. Well, real quick here, as far as my time with the iPhone 10, you can, can't see it because it's inside the case. And uh, by the way, tons of notifications, right? Uh, the notification system bugged me last time. It still bugs me. It's like I, I basically use it at a glance, but I don't use it for, tri for, for like triage of my stuff because it's just so complicated compared to what I'm used to on Android. I can actually use it as like a workflow for, oh, I got rid of that thing. I got done. It just feels so overwhelming on iOS and I'm not sure why. So I feel meh about that. Face unlock, I've been really happy with. I'd say 90% of the time it works, you know, with an extra 10%. And in some things, like if I went to use wireless payments, like Apple Pay or whatever, and it worked 90% of the time, I, I would imagine that would be like too much of a failure rate to, to the point to where I would want to just pay with a credit card because I know that works every time. But with face unlock, it's really not that big a deal because we're so used to entering our pin that this is basically like 90% of the time you don't have to enter your pin. And so that leaves 10% that you do when that's not that bad. The gestures, which is a big part of this compared to the previous versions of, of the iPhone, um, super intuitive. I mean, I, I understood the gestures almost immediately. And I learned my favorite one not too long ago. I think Leo, 
Leo pointed this out. It may have been you. I can't remember. But I hate multitask switching on on iOS because I feel like it, with the gesture swiping up from the bottom and holding and waiting and then tapping the other one takes too long. But apparently, if you go down on the bottom and you swipe left and right, it switches you between apps. Oh, yeah. And that's amazing. Mm. So anyways, I like that a lot. Super fast. Uh, great haptic response. You definitely feel it if this is in your pocket and you get some sort of a notification. Um, not a fan of the alarm clock. I'm, I'm, I'm searching right now for an alarm clock replacement that I like. What's so, wrong with the alarm clock? I want two things out of my alarm clock that I'm used to having on, on my phone with the app that I use, and I think it's timely. Um, I can't remember which app it is. Anyways, uh, one, I want a gentle fade in. I don't want an alarm that suddenly just out of nowhere goes, you know, like I want it to be like doo -doo 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 -doo, fade up. And that's a, that's a standard feature that a lot of apps have, but this one doesn't. So that's one thing. And then another thing is when it's going off, I don't want to have to look at the phone and find the button and touch it. I just want to touch the screen and have that turn it off. Mm. And I, I just get annoyed that I have to like find the thing and actually look at my phone before I'm awake. So if there's an alarm going off on my Android phone, I just touch it. Like I don't have to. The app it. that I'm using, which I think is timely. Uh, yeah. I mean, just touch yeah, it's just going off and I just touch the screen and that wow. snoozes it. Hmm. And I don't know. I like that better. So, but overall I would say it's fine. I, I get a little bored cause I don't end up, I don't know. I guess it's just because I'm not as comfortable with this platform as I am with Android or that I just use them differently, but I get a little kind of like bored, like on Android, I'm happy to like dive in and do things with it. And here I'm just like, eh, I check my email. Okay, I'm done. I know that. That's what you I know. think. I don't know why we didn't experience that last year, but I feel like that's what most of our conversations are. Like I'm excited to like figure things out. And you're like, it works perfectly fine as a phone. It does everything <laughs> I need to, except for I need to find an app where I can just touch the screen. Cause yeah, I'll, I'll hook you up. It's, it's a good experience that way. All right, so that's where we are. We've got another month in the Twit Switch, a whole month, so I'm sure we'll come up with lots of golden nuggets. We'll share them with you as we go along. Uh, as we all know, Apple doesn't like to be rushed in things. It releases its products when it feels it's right. Release date confirmations be damned. Their home assistant speaker, the HomePod, uh, was originally confirmed to release last December, but ultimately got delayed beyond the holidays. And now Apple is ready to get these out to people. And by these, I do not mean this. <laughs> The actual ones. It's jo <laughs> Joining us to talk about the product and the competitive market is Shara Tipkin from CNET. How's it, how's it going, Shara? Great. How are you guys? Awesome. It's great to get you on the show today. Thank you for joining us. So uh, first, I guess we should start with the basics. Tell us when and how people are going to be able to get a HomePod for themselves. What, what exactly are the details? Well, in typical Apple fashion, you'll be able to pre-order it and then get it later. Uh, Pre-orders start tonight at midnight Pacific time. So you'll be able to log on to uh, Apple's store online, um, you know, place your pre-order. You'll actually get it February 9th. So you have to wait a couple weeks. Um, so, you know, a lot of people have argued that Apple has maybe waited just a little too long uh, <laughs> or at least <laughs> long enough to kind of complicate the release of the device. Uh, competitors, I mean, we, we're talking about them all the time, Google Home, uh, the Amazon Echo, they have a very strong hold on this home assistant market right now, but this is kind of typical for Apple. Is Apple late to the game or are they playing their their usual card where they come in after everybody's already kind of got a foothold and they show you what you didn't do all along, what you did wrong? Uh, I think that's kind of debatable whether you're um, in the Apple eco ecosystem already or if you're not. If you have an iPhone, an iPad, an Apple Watch, a Mac, um, AirPods, everything, you're probably going to buy this. You're not going to get an Echo um, unless you already have an Echo. I think uh, researchers have found a lot of people who buy Amazon Echo products are actually iPhone users. Um, the problem, I think, with, with the HomePod versus some of the other products Apple has released is it actually isn't, it doesn't have as many capabilities as the other products that we have on the mock on the market. Mm -hmm. So when Apple came out with the iPhone, it was, you know, this huge dramatic change. People hadn't been able to touch the screens of their phones before. Um, you know, it was a music player, a phone, all of these things in one system. The HomePod, Apple's really positioning it first as a good speaker, and they're kind of almost downplaying the actual smart capabilities. So unlike the Echo, where you have all of these different skills it can learn, uh, the HomePod's going to be more limited right away. 
Yeah, I'm exactly the person you describe.、Uh, Apple Watch, Mac, iPhone, iPad, and also what、well, you didn't mention, Apple Music, which is the big thing. Like, I pay $14.99、yeah. every month for my whole family. They refuse to switch. Over to Amazon or Google Play Music or Spotify because they have all their, their playlists in there.、Um, and I have Echoes in every single room.、Um, but so I don't know if it's enough for me to, to get one, especially with the price. Can you talk a little bit about the price? It's $345.、Yeah. Where, where does that fall in the、yeah. market? What do you Three, think of that? $349. I mean, that's triple the price, more than triple the price of an Echo. Uh, the new second generation Echoes, a hundred bucks.、Um, at, at the holidays, if you were looking for an Echo Dot or one of Google's、um, smart assistant speakers, you could get those for $29. So,、uh, you know, $349 is asking a lot for this.、Um, Sonos actually just came out with a deal where you can buy two of their speakers, their smart speakers that work with us, for,、um, for the price of one HomePod. Uh, and, you know, in terms of good speakers, I think it's hard to argue that Sonos doesn't make <laughs> very good speakers.、Uh, so if, you, if you're looking for it just for the audio capability, there's alternatives. If you're looking for the smart speaker、um, capabilities, there's a lot of cheaper options. Yeah, when I look at,、um, at the HomePod, it's, it's almost like I. I'm less inclined to compare it against the Amazon Echo, which was, you know, kind of the trendsetter, the, the, the market leader in the space.、Uh, I'm, I'm more inclined to compare it to the Google Home Max, which is like, yes, it's a personal assistant, but it's really designed for someone who likes music. It's, it's almost like that's, that's almost its primary function. And hey, it happens to have Siri in there kind of, you know, walking around asking you what you want to do as well. <laughs> I mean, would you agree about that? Have you been able to check out the, the Google Home Max at all in comparison? I haven't used, no, I haven't used the Google Home Max.、Um, I did get to see the Home Pod in June when Apple announced it at WWDC, but that was kind of a controlled demo. So you could hear it next to a couple other rivals. And, you know, it, it sounded great, but I think we'll have to wait to see until CNET's reviewers and other reviewers actually get these and can play with these and test these.、Um, You know, put these through all of the things that you're going to want to do with it.、Yeah. Um, you know, Apple, Apple's roots are a lot in music. You know, there was the iPod.、Uh, they've really done, tried to do a lot with Apple Music.、Um, but if you're a Spotify user, the HomePod may not be something that you want. You can't ask Siri to play your playlist on Spotify. You can play your music from Apple Music, but、um, any of those other music services, you're going to have to connect with. With Bluetooth. So at that point, it becomes less of a smart speaker and it's just, you know, a speaker again. Right.、Um, so, you know, it really just depends, you know, for you, like what services you're using, what other devices you have,、um, you know, and if you're willing to spend that much money. What about HomeKit compatibility? I know a lot of the Internet of Things、uh, home devices. Are not HomeKit compatible. I know that they, they much more quickly get、uh, compatible with Amazon、um, and you know, other, other kind of、uh, services. Will, do you think that'll change the market? Do you think, with the, do you think the HomePod is going to function as a home, HomeKit hub? And do you think more devices will then become compatible with HomeKit? Yeah, one of the features of HomePod is that you can control your smart home devices.、Um, It's kind of interesting. Like CES several years ago, if you walked around, you saw all of these devices that synced with Apple products. So there were like speakers,、um, you know, iPhone cases, tons of different Apple products, even though Apple wasn't actually at the show.、Uh, this year, it really seemed like the Amazon show. There were so many different devices, so many different home products that work with us. So you can just.、Um, Call on this to turn off your lights or whatever it is you want to do. Apple is behind when it comes to the smart home. They've been pushing、um, HomeKit for a while, but we just haven't seen as many devices. It's kind of been a little slower to roll out.、Um, you know, we'll have to see. CNET has a huge、um, team in Kentucky that specifically looks just at smart home products. So they'll be all over this, seeing how it works to control your lights or.、Um, You know, lock your doors or whatever it is you want to try to do with it.、Um, but, you know, that is one of the, the things that you'll be able to do with HomePod. We'll just have to see how well it actually works. Yeah, how well that translates. Because I, I will admit, when we first started hearing about HomeKit, 
Like I feel like in the in the world of of uh, the connected home and IoT devices, that feels like eternity ago. And when yeah. I heard when we heard about HomeKit, kit, I was like, well, there we go. Apple did it again. You know what I mean? They got they got in on something that that is right on the cusp of being a big deal and they're going to win at this. But it really seems like that actually hasn't happened. And I mean, I mean, part of the reason is because there there wasn't this kind of this uh, this Trojan horse to get in there and and have control in the way that the other devices have done. That's one, you know, one big way that they've been able to to succeed as well as they have and actually to lift the entire IoT market up as a result. Suddenly people have an easy way to control uh, all their devices. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, it's it's kind of funny, like people say that if Amazon had actually succeeded when it tried to make a smartphone, it may not have have this position that it has right now in the smart home. Um, but instead, uh, we see so many different products. Um, you know, even Samsung, it has its own voice assistant. It's it's also doing things with us. Um, it's you just you almost can't ignore it if you're if you're in smart home right now. Um, you know, and Amazon just keeps trying to make us smarter and smarter. Yeah. Um, that's what Apple really is going to have to do with Siri is make it able to um, do everything we want to do with it. And, you know, if, if you need Siri to work, if you're telling it to lock your front door or yeah. to turn on your lights. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's one of my questions that I have for you is that, you know, Siri has been improved, uh, over, you know, very recently. And so I imagine that gets folded into the HomePod product that we get, but I mean, this puts Siri front and center. Do you, uh, do you think that Siri is going to enable the HomePod to thrive based on what you've seen as far as improvements in Siri at this point? Um, or, I mean, do we have another Apple Hi-Fi on our hands, potentially? <laughs> um, I think we're going to have to see. I, I don't, you know, I think that I think that HomePod probably will succeed even if everybody turns off Siri and just uses it as a very nice yeah, speaker. Yeah, fair enough. Um, you know, if you look at AirPods, those are incredibly popular um, I know a lot of people who have them and deactivate Siri. Uh, you know, there's an option to turn that off. So when you tap it, instead, it, it goes forward to the next song instead of um, having to call on Siri. So, um, you know, Apple is is constantly trying to improve Siri. They're, um, you know, they 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 keep rolling out improvements. There's no way they're going to stop doing that. It just... Um, We'll have to see if it can kind of catch up with what we're seeing with Scala uh, and the Google Assistant and some of these smart assistants that researchers say are ahead of Siri at this point. Right, right. Um, so final question, are you going to be getting one of these? Is this uh, checking any boxes for you? Uh, I think I'm going to wait and see, actually. Um, I'm kind of a, I, I listen to music all the time, but I'm often listening to it on headphones. I'm not. Yeah. And um, for me, a smart speaker, I'm still a little hesitant about those. Um, one of the things Apple really does have going for it is its privacy. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't sell your data. It sells you devices, uh, which is different from what we see from the other smart speaker guys. So that, you know, that's a potential benefit with them. But um, I'm not sure if I'll be pre-ordering tonight. Gotcha. All right, Shop, uh, Shara Tipkin from CNET. Really appreciate you taking time uh, to join us and share your thoughts on the HomePod. Where can people follow all of your work online? Uh, yeah, I'm on uh, CNET.com. Awesome. That's easy enough. All right, yeah. Shara, thank you again. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks. All right, take care. After the break, would you shop in a store covered in cameras if it meant you didn't have to talk to anyone? Spoiler alert. <laughs> I would do that. I would, for sure. But first, let's take a minute to thank Grammarly because this episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Grammarly. Grammarly's AI-powered products help communicate more effectively. I use Grammarly for emails, writing for this show, posting on social media, and anywhere else. I don't want to be caught by the grammar police. I copy and paste any text I write into Grammarly's online text editor. I've also installed Grammarly's free browser extension for Chrome. If you use Safari or Firefox, it works there too. Grammarly corrects hundreds of grammar, punctuation, and spelling mistakes while also catching contextual errors, improving your vocabulary, and suggesting style improvements. Grammarly uses algorithms that they developed with the world's leading linguists. It doesn't just fix the errors for you. Grammarly gives you detailed explanations for all your mistakes 
And you also get weekly progress reports if you're into that sort of thing. Write confidently and mistake-free on Gmail, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and nearly anywhere else you write on the web. The Grammarly blog offers daily tips and insights on how to improve your day-to-day -day writing to achieve personal and professional goals. Get started and join me and more than 10 million happy Grammarly Chrome users today. Download Grammarly now for free at getgrammarly.com slash twit. That's getgrammarly.com slash twit. And we thank Grammarly for their support. This week, Amazon opened its cashierless store to the public. Walk into the Amazon Go, scan your phone, grab your stuff and run as fast as you can or walk slowly, that is also fine. You'll get charged either way. Joining mm -hmm. us to talk about his experience in the Amazon Go is our old friend, Sam Scovich from Ars Technica. Hello, Sam. Hello, hello. I am calling y'all from uh, Dallas, Texas, as opposed to Seattle, Washington. Just want to show you, this is the actual <laughs> thing in the room I'm in right now at my mother's house. Mirror, mirror <laughs> on the room. wall. I am my mother after all. <laughs> so just, you know, go ahead and tag that one for any of my social Thank media you. profiles. But before heading to uh, <laughs> visit some family, I did indeed stop at Amazon Go, which just opened on Monday in Seattle, right inside of one of Amazon's corporate buildings downtown on 7th Avenue. So it's not like a convenient, say, uh, grab and go place for a lot of folks. It's kind of close to a bunch of other stuff. But yeah, you, it's more convenient if you work at Amazon to go to Amazon Go. So you, uh, this wasn't a press event or anything. You were just a regular customer buying your groceries. They did not give me the one day in advance notice mm. to uh, go in and only like casually and barely look at it. I went full blown, wanted to see how it would actually work for the public. I'd actually tried getting in there a little over a year ago when they had announced its soft opening for employees only back in December of 2016. I'd actually at that point walked right up to the door taking photos and there were these plain clothes security officers giving me this real stink eye. That was back in 2016. Now anyone can just go in. The app works. I actually just checked in my app. My, I have not had my account discontinued. It's still working on the phone. Uh, and I was able to walk in as long as I had the app. Uh, there's a turnstile with a little uh, plastic glass plate and you have to put down a special barcode on the Amazon Go turnstile. At that point, it lets you walk through. And what it's doing at that moment, and it's got a little bit of a pause about the same as if you're at the airport scanning a code with your phone. Uh, the reason it's doing that pause is not to read the code. It is so a camera array can see you, get a sense of your general profile, your height, your shape, your colors, uh, whether you're wearing a really stupid hat, and then create a profile of you. And at that point, you are handed off to a grid of over 100 connected cameras that all look like little two and a half inch uh, hard drives, all arrayed in the ceiling. And you've already uh, on the video feed shown some of the images that I took of these little cameras. Um, there's a few uh, globe style security cameras, but most of these look to uh, be a bit more of an infrared style with a very small lens and a processing unit baked in. That's, uh, I, I believe, taking a more of a profile of you. So the idea is once you've scanned yourself, it's just watching you shop. And the whole commerce part of the shop, which by the way is like a 7-Eleven in terms of grab and grow groceries, grab and go groceries, pardon me, um, is you just take whatever you wanna buy, put it in a bag. And then if you decide, oh, I don't want that thing, you put it back in the shelf. Uh, and once you leave, all of the cameras have tracked you. And about 10 minutes later, an email comes in that says, this is what you bought. Uh, and if for any reason it got it wrong, you go into the app and you say, I want that refunded. And it'll just refund it. Uh, and the two times I went in and bought stuff and tried to mess with it, it charged me exactly for what I took. That is so, this is kind of blowing me away. So the, the, the barcode, it's not like it's scanning that and then like that makes a connection to your phone to say, all right, anything that, well, I guess it, I guess it kind of is, right? It's connecting your phone to you, to the cameras and to everything you pull off the shelves. It just seems like it would be really easy to throw off because it's scanning so many people all at the same time. Exactly. And the whole point of that? these zillions of cameras is that they can therefore track up to 90 people. That's the fire marshal limit. And I imagine that's also uh, the technological limit. This is an 1800 square foot spot. So a bit bigger than an average bodega, barely. Um, and again, with all the stuff you pick up, there's no extra codes. There's no extra weight uh, sensors. There's no RFID chips. If you pick up a Coke can, it is just a Coke can. Everything that you're picking up is being watched. And the whole 
alpha and omega of this process is it seeing what you take and then you take it. And in the article I did for Ars Technica earlier this week, I looked at, um, while I was there, the way everything was arranged in the store. Um, colors were very important, shapes were very important. It felt like anywhere you went, the very important thing was one, that uh, you could just grab everything and it'd be visible. I mean, you can see in the image right now I'm looking, it's these Gatorade bottles that are sort of perfectly colored and aligned. I'm not sure that the color is necessarily important for the sensors, but it is important if you decide you don't want something and you want to put it back. Because there is a lot, there are a lot of people there who are making sure everything is presented and placed perfectly. And they all have little um, smartphones that are tracking all the inventory in case you screw anything up as a customer. And they weren't answering a lot of very specific questions about technology. Anytime I asked anything, I was told, go check our website. And where you see a generic message about machine learning and camera sensing. So Amazon is not really eager to give away the secrets of how this is working. But you're saying that they're not necessarily scanning our face and not recognizing us that way. Is that the implication? I think if they were trying to just scan the face, perhaps some fidelity and some information would be lost. I think they need a lot of data in order to be 100% sure of who is buying what. Um, now, again, if you have multiple people with you, let's say you're, you've got a family and you want to let some kids in, you take uh, your, your sensor, uh, I'm sorry, you your code on your phone, it's a giant QR code, and you tap it to let someone else in. Because the idea is that the code is matching uh, that person with your shopping profile, which, by the way, has your Amazon account loaded, no Amazon Prime required, and it also has your credit card information loaded. And you say, this is the credit card I want charged for all my Amazon Go shopping. From that point on, anyone who's scanned to your shopping profile uh, charges your account. Let's say you decide to grab something for uh, someone who's a little feeble. Oh, I'll reach that for you, miss. Uh-uh. If you grab that item, you're charged for it. Oh, so oh, they're teaching no people, people yeah, out. good Samaritans yeah. out the door. Okay, so uh, you said earlier that if you didn't buy something that shows up in your receipt, you can just say, I didn't buy it. What's keeping me from grabbing a whole bunch of stuff and then saying I didn't buy it? That's a great question, <laughs> Megan. In fact, just Besides for my moral compass, I, I mean. Well, that, I tested my moral compass because when I went in, I said, well, goodness, that refund thing seems really easy to do. And it even tells you, you don't have to take stuff back if you hit refund. So I sure enough, I went in for my first shopping trip and after picking up and dropping things, juggling stuff around, I had my phone in my hand, a camera in my hand, some other stuff. I kept doing all this random crap to try to trip it up. Didn't work. So then uh, when I left and everything was charged appropriately, I just said, nah, I don't want that yogurt. And I tapped refund on the yogurt and I said I didn't like it and it gave me my money back. And I thought about eating the yogurt and then I went back for a second trip and just handed the yogurt to somebody. Oh. And he just gave me this sort of look like, really? You're going to give me the yogurt? Okay. <laughs> look, um, I'm a journalist, all right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. It's about ethics and yogurt journalism. But <laughs> my second trip in, I actually was asked by my boss, hey, can you go back with something you bought and eat it or drink it while you're in the shop? So I did. I took a Coke and popped it before walking in. This is what I had purchased. And then I went and grabbed the same uh, Coke to try and buy while drinking the first one, uh, went around, took that Coke out, put it away, drank it again, bought it again, put it away again, and ultimately took one of those with the other one in my hand. And it charged me for just one. It knew. It just understood uh, what I, it seemed to be only interested in the merchandise. Like it's watching that interaction and that's really it. Wow. This is kind of blowing my mind. Mm -hmm. I, when we first heard about this, I was kind of like, oh, yeah, that's that's kind of cool. I, I, I don't know how I thought it would work, but this sounds really complex. Like, I'm really amazed that Amazon could track up to 90 people from the top down. It's not like the most identifiable portion of you is being followed to, to add up the things that you add. It's almost like they know that this blob of hair is different from that blob of hair. I uh, will say there is one weird. other set of sensors that I was not 100% sure on, and they, no one answered this. But there are apparent sensors in each refrigerator unit, and there may be sensors in back in the walls so it's not just the array that's up there. And that's the obvious one. But I think there could be all kinds of other camera tracking. There it is, if you're looking on the web, on the camera feed. Uh, that it, One of those little chunks was inside of each shelf of the refrigerators. Mm -hmm. And that was a lot of those. And I saw them in other spots on the walls, but were harder to pick out. So the total camera array is currently unclear. And I mean, it took them a little over a year to get to this point. And before that, they had definitely been testing privately in these sort of fake grocery rooms inside of Amazon headquarters itself, where you had to actually go through all these gates and 
barcode things to even see them. So this is not, you know, blink and it's there. It's been a while. And this is an incredibly controlled environment, meaning not a shopping mall. This isn't clothing where you're grabbing a jacket with a puppy shape off of a shelf. You know, these are clear, rigid squares and cans coming out of a shelf in a very specific spot. So I imagine we're going to see over the next week or two people trying to game the system, people coming up with tricks. Perhaps yeah. a giant poofy hat would do it. I've actually seriously thought about going to like an anachronistic society in Seattle, getting people with giant Renaissance era hats and just eight of us going in just to see if perhaps that obscuring of visual data would do the trick. We really, it's really unclear what will be gamed and what will be controlled and what will be figured out and exploited. But if it's a computer system, you know people will try. Yeah. Well, also, I mean, but then you're connected to, it's connected to your Amazon account. And if we've learned anything in the last few years, we can't survive without Amazon on Earth, right? I mean, I'm at the well, point where I get something from Amazon every day. What was that? The thing is, they, they, they can't survive without us. They yes. want this data. And man, oh man, do they love the idea of knowing every single way we shop. They want to be part of the entire commerce mm -hmm. process, whether it's credit cards, shopping directly from Amazon, from partners. And goodness, wouldn't it be great if they could watch us inside of malls and create perfectly tracked profiles with our contact information linked with every single click. I really do wonder what the three steps ahead of this process is. Yeah. Because what I've learned in years of of looking at Amazon is what we see publicly facing in the consumer field is just three steps behind what they're really doing. So clearly they want physical domination. Owning Whole Foods is going to be a part of that. What they track over at Whole Foods is gonna be really interesting. They've said this is not coming to Whole Foods and God, those stores are a lot larger than 1,800 square feet. So I can't even imagine how many little hard drive size cameras it would take. I know there there would have to be some other scanning and seeking process that would have to come in like V2 or V3. But you know that is this is not the end. They're not done watching us in public. I know, and I think that it's it's sort of like the element of distraction. Like everyone's concerned with like how can I shoplift from this store? But really, what small items can be shoplifted. Obviously people will get away with shoplifting, but this money they're saving on not having to pay people to work there is way more than yeah. that. And I've been talking a lot more about the technical stuff than about the sheer humanity of, you're not talking to a person. They're not checking mm -hmm. your stuff. You're not asking questions. You're not doing that sort of clerk interaction. And as you'd said at the top of the segment, Megan, there's people who just don't really want that depending on their store. If they really hate the guy at Whole, uh, Whole Foods or Trader Joe's who's got that man bun or whatever. Uh, but and conversely, there was a sensation I had when I was there of talking to the woman, the one clerk who actually needed to interact with customers was the 21 and up beer and wine section handler. You had to have your ID checked in order to grab beer and wine, which you would then just throw in your bag and go and not even think about it. Uh, and it was a, this nice conversation. How's it going? How long have you been involved with this store? What do you think? And she asked a couple questions about my experience and it was very brief, but compared to the whole like staring at phone and silently marching through and ooing and aahing at the robots watching me, it was this nice little moment. Was it quiet while you were there? Like, it was, was everybody mostly, just silent? I, mean, I was on day one, and that meant everybody was just asking questions. In fact, uh, okay. at one point, I'd said something slightly technical, and I got swarmed. People were like, do you know how it works? <laughs> Is this a weight sensor? Is this an RFID chip? I'm like... Even if I did know, I wasn't going to tell you, man. I, well, I mean, to be fair, Sam, if I saw you, I would probably ask you questions, too. You look like you <laughs> might work there. I mean, what is that supposed to mean? <laughs> You're just missing the, the hair, man bun. The, it's the I orange, mean, you know. I don't know. I've gotten myself into a place I don't want. <laughs> I don't like. This is getting into some gingerism right here is what I'm it is. Sorry. <laughs> no, you just Hold also look like, very Seattle. A really nice Americano coffee just to seal the cliche deal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you so much for joining us, Sam. I hope you'll come back, even though I oh, seem to have insulted I mean, you. I, <laughs> until you get the, you know, the the camera rigs to just track me and figure out my biological profile and just have virtual Sam replace me. You know, I figure that's the next step for the Sam Amazon Go stuff. But I'll be going back. I'm going to check it out, write about it some more. So keep it tuned to Ars Technica if you're really interested about this tech and about me trying to exploit it because I'm going to try. <laughs> Sam Muscovich, also known as Sam Amazon Go, uh, is a culture reporter at Ars Technica and at Sam Red on Twitter. Thank you so much. See you guys Thank soon. You, Sam.
<laughs> Take care. All right, up next, we're going to be talking with, well, you, you've heard of Snopes, right? We've got someone from Snopes on the line to talk a little bit about Facebook and misinformation, all that kind of stuff. But first... We're going to take a moment to thank the sponsor of this episode, and that is Grasshopper. Grasshopper is a virtual phone system that's designed for entrepreneurs. Uh, Grasshopper works just like a traditional phone system, but it requires no hardware purchase. They have the iOS or the Android app. Whatever phone you have, you can install that. Callers can reach you wherever you are on your mobile phone. Grasshopper allows you to keep your existing number so you can maintain your brand. And then when you make a call, your client will see your Grasshopper caller ID instead of your personal phone number. You simply select a toll-free or a local number. You can record a custom greeting, add multiple extensions for your business. Of course, if you have a toll-free number, that's awesome for marketing. It makes your business sound even more prof professional and you're managing that from your mobile phone. That's what's so cool. Set up department and employee extensions with custom call forwarding to any phone in the world. You can get your voicemails emailed to you as audio attachments. You can also send and receive SMS text messages from your business number, all on the same phone that you're using uh, for yourself as well. Join the over 250,000 Grasshopper customers today. Plans start at just $12 per month, and you have a 30-day money-back guarantee. So turn your smartphone into a business line with Grasshopper to save $50 on your order, go to trygrasshopper.com slash twit. That's trygrasshopper.com slash twit. And we thank Grasshopper for their support of Tech News Weekly. Late last week, Facebook announced that they're going to take into account how trusted a publisher is when algorithmically showing you a story in your timeline, but trusted according to whom? Joining us to talk about trust, the media, and Facebook is Brooke Binkowski, managing editor at Snopes. Welcome, Brooke. Hello, thank you. So last week, uh, Zuckerberg wrote, uh, wrote on Facebook that there's too much sensationalism, misinformation, and polarization in the world today. I'm sure this is a sentiment you can agree with. Uh, what do you think Facebook can do about this? Oh, I have so many ideas about what Facebook can do. But what it starts with and, and ends with really is um, moderation. They need to have, I, I know they have an army of moderators, and I know that the moderators know how to do what they do. They need to be employed to do what they do, and that is not censorship. It's not censorship to cut back on hate speech or just to tell people, no, you cannot, you know, put this really awful story out, you know, that's gonna gin people up and, and make them even more xenophobic. It, it's just actual moderation. It's, you know, what we used to do on the internet, you know, in my day, back in the, the wild halcyon days of 2014. Um, the, <laughs> other thing, <laughs> the other thing I'd really like to see and this is a little bit less realistic. Um, I would love to see Facebook, Twitter, um, Google, like all the big social media and um, internet companies to establish foundations and start pouring money into newsrooms because I think that that really is the only way that A, that newsrooms are going to make any money at all, and B, that you know we can like beat back the disinformation and misinformation and outright propaganda that's circulating right now. I mean, we're a small team. We can only do as much as a small team can, and that's not enough. There needs to be a robust journalism sector in the United States and anywhere else that's being affected by disinformation. That is the only way to combat active measures. Snopes. By the way, I'm a big fan of Snopes. Use it for years, so I love what you guys are doing and have for a very long time. Uh, all about identifying fake versus real. How do you feel about the efficacy of everyday users being the ones to determine this versus, uh, you know, versus like what you're talking about? I mean, it, could it be a mixture of both? Is is that kind of the the balance that works? Absolutely. I mean, if you have some kind of community feel and people being watchdogs, whether they're self appointed or not, that's going to go a long way toward establishing some sense of veracity or at least a baseline of facts that people can agree on. Without that, we have no democracy at all. So that's, I mean, that's, that's where we're at right now. I can't believe I'm discussing the effects of social media on democracies all over the world. It's just what a weird time to be alive. But yeah, I think a combination of, of users, everyday users, uh, moderators who are unpaid, moderators who are paid, people who just care, and uh, sites like ours, PolitiFact, FactCheck, um, I, I think that that should be enough, but I don't know if it's going to be immediate. I mean, it seems to me that um, it takes 
a couple of days at most for people to become more civil to each other when they stop being inundated with propaganda. That's a really unscientific thing I just said, so I have no proof. It's just my own observation. Um, it seems like people's brains start to go back to normal after a couple of days. Um, and so I think it would be I think it would be very effective and I think it would happen really fast, but you have to implement it first. That's the problem that I see. Now, a lot was made of this survey that Facebook said they were going to do, but BuzzFeed confirmed that there were only two questions on the survey. One was, do you recognize the following websites? Yes or no. And then two, how much do you trust each of these domains? And so I, I imagine that those those are two questions that you ask yourself, you and other your other writers and editors at Snope ask yourself, ask yourself, but I imagine there's a lot more questions <laughs> that you ask before you are able to debunk something or confirm something on Snopes. What are some of the other things that that you then ask yourself? What 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 is your research involved when you're um, when you're working on a story for Snopes? Uh, you know, we get asked this question all the time, and it's so disappointing to people when I tell them <laughs> what it actually entails. It's just journalism. What we do is we track down stories. I spent much of today uh, trying to track down the provenance of a photograph from, I believe it's from uh, an immigration march in 2010, and somebody photoshopped out whatever the this guy is holding a sign. He's photoshopped out whatever the sign says, or somebody has photoshopped that out, and put in some some really xenophobic and racist stuff, basically saying, you know, we are going to kill more cops if we don't get free housing and food and school, you know, kind of thing. And it's being passed around with this whole, you know, well, what do you expect from those people type thing? So uh, when it comes to stuff like that, we kind of do this sort of like digital forensic stuff, and we do a reverse image search. Um, and if that doesn't work like it didn't in this case, I start calling in favors from my friends who are uh, reporters and photographers who I know were there at that event at that time. Um, that didn't work. So now I'm calling uh, people like organizations I knew who were at the march to see if they saw a sign like that. So it's very time consuming and frustrating sometimes. It's just journalism. It's not it, as, as, as fun as journalism is. It's not always the sexiest thing. And so we do investigative journalism and it's just not always very sexy. Sometimes we get an easy one like Something that comes from the last line of defense or Ladies of Liberty or Le Reagan is right. They're part of this network of sites that only publish satire. They make everything up and it's still kind of corrosive and, and disinformation-esque. But since they have a disclaimer, I can't really fault them too much for it, uh, except for the fact that it's not really very funny. Um, so those are the easy You can ones. fault them for that. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay good. I, uh, if you're going to have satire, it's got to at least be funny, right? So... Um, with those guys, we don't really have to do much of any tracking anything down because we already know it's fake. Sometimes if it's a slow day, we get really didactic about it. And we're like, OK, well, we won't just say this is fake. We're going to explain why this is fake and why this is dumb and why you should never believe this. Um, like, for example, t one of today's and today was one of the days when we didn't have a lot of time. But one of today's was um, is uh, Mueller having an affair with Nancy Pelosi. And like, really? I mean, really? <laughs> Can you see why that might be dumb? <laughs> but uh, yeah, we didn't really need to do much to debunk that because it came from one of those sites. Sure. So, so if it's so easy and it's just journalism, why aren't more people doing it? Like, I mean, I know all the, I, I know there are more journalists out there than just Snopes, but but why, why would you say you guys are like the gold standard when you want to prove something? Like, why not the New York Times or the Washington Post? Like, why, why Snopes? I, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm happy that we, we got this opportunity to sort of be front and center, but I, I don't understand why, and it's not that I don't understand why we're successful. I mean, I do understand why we've become successful because we are really exacting. And we, when we make mistakes, as much as we hate it, we own up to it and correct it. And then I have nightmares about it, like for, for like months afterwards, like, <gasps> oh, I screwed something up, you know, kind of thing. And um, so it's um, like, we have high standards, but the only reason I can see that others aren't quite as, uh, you know, don't have quite the reputation that we do is because, um, well, there have been a number of smear campaigns against journalists and journalism outfits since 2016, for one thing, uh, including us. Um, but for another thing, I think that um, they just haven't, like, positioned themselves as fact checkers and they haven't perhaps owned up as readily to their mistakes. Although Washington Post has PolitiFact. So, I mean, they are doing that. Right. Um, it's just, we were the first, I think. Yeah, we were the first site. And so I, I think it just sort of went from there. 
I, I guess just a combination of luck and being pains in the butt to everybody. Have you seen a sharp kind of turn in what you at Snopes have been busting, uh, you know, years ago versus what you are now? Obviously, this is the era of quote unquote fake news. There's been a large, you know, I mean, there's a large emphasis on this in it just in the world the last couple of years. So I imagine that's affected traffic for you guys uh, and also, you know, the deals that you have uh, to kind of fact check on on platforms like Facebook and, and whatever. But I mean. Has, has the content that you're fact checking overall become a much more political now or was it always political? Because I, f- I feel like, you know, in the early days when I used Snopes, it was usually that random meme that was being passed around on Facebook that, you know, my, that my mom sent to someone. And I'm like, yeah, that doesn't really sound right. You know, it had nothing to do with politics. It just sounded weird. And I know you guys did a lot of, of fact checking on stuff like that. Uh, but I mean, I feel like now... Like you could, I mean, you could fill your entire log with nothing but, but politics. It's got to be a little draining, to be honest. <laughs> like, I like to tell people, you know, I did not have these when I started. <laughs> I mean, I didn't. It's just become this sort of like, you know, I've got these hollow eyes and I'm always sort of disheveled now. And I'm just like, <laughs> 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 but it has um, extremely politicized. Yeah. And I believe that um, at the risk of sounding like a kook, which I will, so whatever, <laughs> um, I, I've, I've read a lot about active measures and about state-sponsored disinformation. And while I'm not on, you know, 100% on the Russia does everything train, I do know how good they are at active measures. Um, and I do know that other countries are following their lead. And if you were going to do your best to subvert Western style democracy and make it look ridiculous, you would do exactly what other countries are doing to us right now. And if you were in a political party that benefited from such disinformation, you would push it out as well within the country. So I think that what we're seeing is a lot of people thinking they're going to benefit personally and very handsomely from spreading this type of disinformation. And the politicized disinformation is att- uh, uh, it's obviously attempts to discredit certain individuals and outfits. Um, like I said, you know, it's been a rough time to be a reporter. There have been a lot of smear campaigns or attempted smear campaigns. Um, but most of what we're seeing that's especially bad that really kicked up in the, in the middle of 2016 was when I first started noticing when I actually said something about it is it's become xenophobic. It's become um, an attempt to exploit the cracks that we have in our society as a country. I mean, we have a lot of stuff that we have not ever contended with or owned up to as a country. And those are very easy to exploit. Uh, People have a lot of unresolved issues um, because of things that have happened in in this country's history. And I'm talking about the the hangover and the legacy of slavery, for example, that's that's gone largely unaddressed. You know, Um, I'm talking about our immigration laws that have been left as legal gray areas and changed around to to suit you know, the, the whims of people who will never be affected by immigration. Um, it's a lot of racialized stuff and it's a lot of xenophobic stuff and tons of white supremacist stuff. And it's beyond upsetting to see, honestly, um, because I, I think we're better than that as a country. I think the UK is better than that. They've had the sim- a similar issue. I think that um, we can do better and we should do better. We owe it to everybody around us to do so. Brooke, thank you so much for uh, for standing up for journalists, for being a journalist, standing up for investigative journalism. Um, and it's not just politics. We, you know, in the last week, Larry Nasser, the uh, Olympic gymnast, he would not have been possibly discovered if it hadn't been for the investigative reporting of the Indianapolis Star. So it's so important. Thank you for doing this work. Brooke is an award-winning journalist and reporter and the managing editor at Snopes. She is Brooklyn Marie on Twitter. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> really appreciate it. Take care. Uh, real quick before the end, we end the show, you want to do a little feedback? Yeah, let's do We're some feedback. Out of order a little bit. Andrew writes, it might be because I hear a bunch of start an IT career commercials on the local radio, but the segment about Google's new IT support certificate seemed more like an infomercial snuck into an episode. Am I wrong in being overly biased due to the local radio ads? I'm curious about the thought process for including that segment. I just thought it was, I mean, I, I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I just thought, you know, any way that you can get people, you know, solve people's needs, 
to sh- share a piece of you know information that might educate them on options that they have is good. And there was a lot of free incentive there too. We certainly didn't approach it as, as like an infomercial. It was just kind of a way to shine a, shine a light on a new possible career path. I don't know. That, that was my thought. But. Well, first of all, thank you for writing, Andrew. Yeah. We'd love to get feedback. Uh, you can uh, email tnw at twit.tv or, or just me, Megan, at twit.tv. Um, don't email Jason because he's got enough email already. <laughs> <laughs> I'm bad at email is basically what Megan means. Um, but it's true. I really uh, enjoyed hearing his perspective that it did sound like an infomercial. We weren't paid. First yeah. of all, <laughs> they Google did not pay us. Yeah. And we reached out to Google. Like, yes. you know. <laughs> we're working to um, hard to figure out, you know, exactly how we're going to take this new show that's only on episode 15. And we want to just not speak to journalists. We want to speak to the people doing things. And so, you know, every once in a while, we see an interesting story that's by one of the big companies, Google, Facebook. Um, you know, we reach out to people uh, to have them come and talk about it on the show. And because they're representing Google, they're going to, right. it's going to be a little bit different than the other interviews we do you know they're going to be this is their work and they're going to be excited about it and you know we're going to push them on points that we feel like we need to be pushed but in this example I don't think that we really felt like we needed to push them they're giving away free education and trying to give it to people who don't have access to that IT education necessarily Um, but thank you for your feedback Andrew we love it yeah, very valuable feedback. And if anyone watching uh, wants to share your feedback on, you know, the types of interviews you like or you don't or whatever, we we welcome that, tnw at twit.tv. And finally, leave it to Burger King to make a point about net neutrality. We all saw this coming, right? Burger King is known as of late for its interesting and PR-generating ad campaigns. We're talking about it on the show, after all. Remember the Google Home ad from last year as just one example. In this new spot, Burger King cashiers show unsuspecting patrons a menu board with prices for its Whopper burger based on the speed of delivery. The Whopper MBPS, or making burgers per second, to illustrate how ridiculous it should be to charge $4.99 for a slow Whopper $12.99 $12.99 for a fast Whopper and $25.99 for a hyper fast Whopper. Obviously, uh, they're making a point of comparison to the net neutrality debate that we've talked about many times in this show. Uh, people freak out in the video because apparently they love their Whoppers just that much. Uh, I can't say that I share that sentiment necessarily, but I really appreciate the ease, the, the way that this is easily relatable. It's a good framing to help explain some of the pain points and to kind of just demystify a little bit what net neutrality actually means when you get right down to it. How does it affect the common user? And this is a great way to frame that. Yeah, I I have mixed feelings about this. First of all, like I desperately want to know if those people are actors or if they were real yeah. customers. I mean, that woman is a great actress. Uh, that uh, that guy was good. There was another guy who was like maybe not the best actor. So I do feel like they were actors, some better than the other, and not real customers. <laughs> <laughs> believe, Megan, believe. And I laugh, but at the same time, it's an ad for Burger yeah. King. Like it's an ad, and I all like I have such a hard time with really wonderful, hilarious ads, especially this one that's taking on a very political uh, subject and and not only just taking it on, but sort of using it a little bit, I think. I mean, there's no doubt that the, that the, you know, the people behind this ad, and my dad was in advertising. I'm all, you know, I'm not trying to make fun of ad men or women, but you know that they're just like, oh, I really want something to go viral. And yeah. they know that like sentiment pro net neutrality sentiment is really viral, whether you understand it or not. So is it, did, does it explain net neutrality? Does it, I mean, uh, yes, sort of. Um, I think it might be exaggerated a little Mm. bit, um, but, and and not completely clear, but I, I, I did get a good laugh out of it. I think, I think you've sold me. I think I've come over to your side because I completely agree with what you're saying. Like, I, I, I just, I, I appreciate that a company like Burger King might actually ha- use the kind of the power and influence and you know brand name knowledge that they have to help explain something that I think a lot of people misunderstand or haven't taken the time to understand potentially don't understand the ramifications of long term and if something like that helps then great right i mean tony roman rico had an interesting piece on this because he was like um has burger king like donated to any of these campaigns that yeah, are trying to put point. you yeah, know have yeah. they written a letter to the fcc and no you know the people that mostly have written letters to fcc like people that it's going to affect you know <laughs> so people who it's going to affect their bottom line right um so yes um 
It's funny. I don't want to pay $27 for a Whopper. I don't want to pay $4.99 for a Whopper. <laughs> good, good to know. I don't, I don't want to pay for a Whopper. Let's just put it that way. Uh, Tech News Weekly records live every Thursday at 2.30 p.m. Pacific. You can be part of the show, as always, by emailing us at tnw at twit.tv. And we also have a survey going on right now, mm -hmm. right? We do. Twit.tv uh, slash survey. Yeah, if you want to let us know, the network know, things you like that we're doing, uh, things you wish you could see, sh share any information that you will and that you want to with us about our content and how you know, how you're liking what we're doing. This will help inform us uh, going into uh, the next year as far as new content, guests, all that kind of stuff. Share as much or as little as you like, and we appreciate it. Uh, Twit.tv slash survey. It's really very short. It's short this year. It's only four minutes long, I think, is what, what it takes. Awesome. And the other way you can show us uh, that you care is by subscribing to our show at twit.tv slash TNW. And the other way you can show us that you care is by tweeting at me, at Megan Maroney. <laughs> and I'm at Jason Howell. Show me how you care. Uh, <laughs> thanks to everyone. I feel like everybody was involved today. So I'm just going to say thanks to everyone. Uh, we really appreciate all the help behind the scenes. And we really needed you today. So thank you for that. Uh, we also have a live guest. Thank you for sitting in and making us feel important today. Uh, and thanks to you for joining us for another episode of Tech News Weekly. We'll see y'all next week. Bye, everybody. Ow. We forgot to read the note. It's oh. To Megan and Jacob. <laughs> Home pod space gray. <laughs> Megan and Jacob. Home pod space gray, sir. Johnny Ive. <laughs> It's almost as if, jeez. <laughs> Megan does not appreciate. Uh, Megan does not appreciate that Sir Johnny Ive called me Jacob. Thank you for having my back, Megan. Yeah, exactly. Yeah.